Hello, I'm Colin Mills and welcome to Skyworks Showcase, an occasional series where we showcase the work of other YouTubers whose content we feel is particularly different, particularly good, and we think you're really going to enjoy. The first of these is Abby Barnes, whose channel, Spend More Time in the Wild, is dedicated to Abby's hiking and adventuring experiences and has captured amazing footage and amazing sequences from her travels around the world. We think you're really going to enjoy this, and I caught up with Abby recently to discuss more about her channel and more about why she became a content creator and how she makes some of these extraordinary documentaries. Abby, lovely to have you on the channel. Uh, welcome again. Um, I think we've always been so impressed by the stuff you've done, um, but particularly one of the things that caught our eye was the amount of time that you've spent in England's Lake District. Um, that's an important place for us, and and I guess it must be for you too. So, what what does it mean to you? No, I think it's a it's a very good question. The Lake District is is a very it has a very special place in my heart. Um, I don't know quite how to turn a feeling into like actual words that you know can really express like what goes on there but it's it's, it's pure magic you know there's something about the proximity of the mountains and the lakes and the valleys and the small farming communities and the the his history of the culture there you know from the sheep grazing to how at one point it was all sort of covered in trees like there's so many stories that you can discover when you're out and about in the Lake District. Um, and I, you know, just when you stand up on one of those hills or fells as they're called locally, um, and you can just see for miles and miles and it, yeah, across to the coast and all the way up to Scotland, it's sort of, you know, that one of the border counties or it was anyway. Um, yeah, and, and I suppose as a kid, we went there quite a bit, sort of on family holidays and things, but it's really only been the last sort of four or five years where I've been going intentionally by myself that I've built my mental map to the extent where, you know, I've, I've climbed most of the mountains there and explored most of the valleys and dipped in a lot of the tarns. Um, and it's just impossible to not go back. Like I make a point of going every year in May um, and it's just it's, it's just pure love, Colin. That's what it is. <laughs> That's what I like to hear. Are there any special places in the lakes that kind of, that have got Abby's name written on them? Yeah, I do love Buttermere. Um, and it, it because it reminds me of my my dog, my Westie, who's passed away now. It's a very special place where I connect with her. Um, and a few other sort of walks that we did together um, that just, you know, really bring a smile to my face. But I think as well, you know, um, the Lake District has so much to offer me personally, but it's also a place where I can really encourage other people to give stuff a go and find their own adventure. Um, so mountains like Skiddle, I find very accessible. You know, there's a very clear path all the way up. And I, I love being able to just go, yeah, you know, you want to climb a mountain, like give yourself a day, find a nice weather window and go do Skiddle, you know. And then obviously there's things like Scarfell Pike, which everyone wants to do, the highest mountain in England. Um, but you don't have to be, you know, scrambling up this route and that route in order to have an awesome adventure. Um, and I think that for me is one of the charms of the place is, you can experience the beauty without pushing yourself physically. And then if you want to flip that on its head, you can push yourself physically and have an awesome challenge and awesome adventure as well. So there's not too many places that really, uh, you know, make me go, oh, yeah, this is my special pace. But just when you drive into that, like, welcome to Cumbria sign, it's like, oh, yeah, this is happening. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Um, what about other places in the UK? Because um, obviously you've you've travelled around a lot in the UK. Are there any other little places that you've found a sort of, you know, right up there? Well, I live right on the edge of Exmoor National Park, and um, it's actually one of the quieter national parks in the country. So there's 15 national parks, um, which really are great places to find sort of gems of a natural environment. And you know, here there's the moorland, there's the coombs, the stories of like Lorna Doon. Um, and it's actually the most wooded stretch of coastland in the country. Um, and for me, it's sort of little things like that that, you know, make me feel like I'm stepping back in time. Um, I'm tapping into the the journey of the land, the history of the land, how it was with our ancestors roaming around, trying to like forge an existence through hunting and gathering, um, hunting and gathering. So, yeah, I do love that. But um, I love Scotland as well. Like, I can't not say Scotland, just the the sense of freedom knowing that you can really go anywhere 
um, and camp anywhere or park the van anywhere. And I have a mild obsession with red squirrels. Um, so being able to find them when I'm out and about is always a wonderful thing as well. Um, so yeah, it, but it's very hard to sort of say, this is the one place where I go. Because to be honest, I spend so much time away, I just want to come home. And the, the charm of the sheep farm that I live on is is plenty enough most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> Although, as well as the UK, I know you've travelled a lot abroad and you made some fantastic documentaries. Um, one of the ones that, again, stood out for us was your, your documentary on Iceland. It was a huge trek. And, um, you know, you were sort of both amongst people and far away from people. And it's such a different place, obviously, from the UK. Um, what were your expectations and, and did it meet them? Was it exactly what you expected to discover? That is a very good question. Um, Iceland has been my favourite country that I've ever visited for a very long time. Um, I first went in 2015 and vowed that I would go back and do some hiking. Um, you know, from the charms of the Wales to the Northern Lights, this vast exposed desolate landscape that is covered under snow and ice for 10 months of the year. Um, so the concept of planning a hike out there just it really, really excited me um, because, you know, I'm looking all the time for sort of bigger, further away adventures um, that are just different. And I think different is definitely the word. Iceland is very, very different. Um, it's like being in the land of Lord and the, of the Rings, you know, and just this immense volcanic landscape with shades of black and green from the ash and the mosses and knowing that any point a volcano can erupt and you're walking past this warning sign and if you see a flare a volcano has erupted and what to do about that and it's just you couldn't make it up like you're walking up this mountainside that's steaming because you know it's still cooling down from its most recent eruption and I'm like yeah let's just follow a footpath along this this is totally normal <laughs> um uh, yeah and I, so I would say I had expectations that I was going to enjoy it but I don't think I anticipated quite how phenomenal the experience would be um, and how, you know, it's a trail and a story that I, I treasure daily. Um, you know, these 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 films that I go and create, it's, it's not just about creating the film. I'm really going through, you know, a very uh, on the ground, tactile experience of personal growth. And by pushing myself through these different challenges and seeing these new landscapes and, and ticking something off that's been on the to-do list for a very long time, or rather the dream list, um, yeah, it creates a very visceral, like, heartfelt experience. And yeah, I treasure that trip. I treasure it a lot. And I, you know, I put so much work into creating that film to very high quality um, from pre, during and post-production. Uh, and I'm absolutely chuffed with the results. Um, but yeah, and you know what? It's such an honour as well to be able to share my adventures through film. Like, what a wonderful, wonderful thing. You know, inspiring and empower people to get outside for mental and physical health is everything that I'm about. And for me, Iceland emulates that mission perfectly, that that hike along the Lorgaviga. You talked about the films. Obviously, your films are fabulous. They're really engrossing. They've got a great story, a great narrative arc. But one of the things that's, that's so interesting also is that because you're actually doing it, you're doing it while you're filming. You're kind of walking, hiking, challenging yourself. You're also making a film, I guess, doing the odd retake and the odd second and third and fourth, and we've all been there. <laughs> so how, I mean, how do you balance that up, particularly when it's getting dark, you kind of could do with the food and a bit of a rest and it's all a bit much. I mean, do you sort of label yourself as a filmmaker or an adventurer or how do you fit into that? I'll tell you what, I don't always get it right. Yeah. Um, there are times where I'll prioritise the filming. Uh, well, no, let me rephrase that. I have a few mottos that I live by when it comes to being on one of these shoots. And one of them is like, don't cut corners. The second one is put the work in. Um, and a third is do it over and over and over again until you've got it right and don't leave till you've got it right, quite frankly. And usually they're all a little bit of a, you know, a whip on the backside because I'm out there and it is ultimately my job to create high quality film. And that's what I'm really proud of. That's my reputation. So I put the work in to achieve that, um, even at the sacrifice of like my own sleep. Um, and, you know, I put in the big miles. Uh, I do an average of three to four miles extra a day, just walking backwards and forwards, shooting these shots where I'm walking and people are like, ah, oh, your camera person must get so sick of this. I'm like, no, no, I am my camera person. <laughs> um, they're entirely self-shot. And that does require a lot of work. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm immensely proud of that. Um, and 
Yeah, you know what? I enjoy the creative process, but I think, you know, it, there are times where it, it does get taxing. It does get wearing. Um, you know, I'm on my feet usually for about 16 hours a day. Uh, and I, sort of when I come home is when I rest if it's not a quick turnaround for the next trail. But yeah, this is why I thought the summer season is so intense for me because it's just keep pushing until sort of we hit the middle of se- to end of September. And then that's when I'm actually back home and I can sort of start to edit things. Um, but yeah, I just... Uh, you know what, Colin? I love it, and it's a it's a massive part of who I am. Creating these films as well, uh, it's a big part of my identity, um, which may or may not be healthy. I don't really know, but just to share these films, like if I'm there, I want to do it properly. Um, well, one of the things that struck one of the things that struck me looking back in your uh, in your amazingly detailed canon of work are some things that you shot and made six years and more ago. Um, you've been doing this for quite a while, and you've been putting out some really good stuff. So what what got you into it? How did you start? What 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 sort of got you on the content bandwagon? Well, I actually started making films sort of a bit more officially when I was 13. Um, I was filming my local wildlife because essentially it was my happy place. I was struggling a lot with my mental health and sort of just filming the the animals and, and learning the bird songs and sort of growing up with these baby rabbits and, and hedgehogs and foxes and badgers was everything I was about. Um, but yeah, I, I read a book, um, a children's book, um, which was essentially, I was by Michael Mopurgo, a famous children's author. Um, and he was talking about the issues surrounding palm oil, which is a, a vegetable oil found in foods and cosmetics. And um, yeah, it really sort of riled me up because obviously he ended up going on to sort of the palm oil plantations and how that was destroying the rainforests. Long story short, for me, it didn't matter if it was the rainforest or the fields around my home, like nature is, it was my home. It was my safe place. So to understand that we had the power to vote with our note and choose food or cosmetic products with or without palm oil was something it's like, well, I want to I want to step up for this cause, you know, as a young person. And so I started to talk to the camera rather than it just being filming the wildlife, but filming myself um, about these environmental issues that I was really passionate about. Um, And off the back of that film, I ended up speaking in the European Parliament to MEPs about the importance of Uh, palm oil being labelled in ingredients and that's now EU law Uh, I wouldn't say I was all of that um, changed but certainly I I feel I had a part in it Um, and then a little bit later on I talked about um, the the issues around marine debris and then I won a film competition awarded by Sir David Attenborough and then after that it was sort of this this hierarchy of three things Um, age 18 two weeks out from my A-levels flew down to Tanzania and summited Mount Kilimanjaro um, the highest mountain in Africa to create a film with these uh, world renowned conservationists about global climate change and how that's impacting the mountains, glaciers. Um, and, you know, f- for me, that sort of rocket propelled my passion for for film as a medium to, to communicate important messages. Um, and then I took a long break from creating films. But ultimately, you know, it's it's been a big part of my life for a very long time and uh, well, still is. <laughs> Well, it shows. I mean, there's there's a lot of love in your films. And I think it's very different when we look at what you've done. Um, they're so different from what people might conventionally regard as the hiking genre. But yours, your stuff really tells a story. And that's, I think, something which, which we found really, really compelling and really interesting. And obviously, a lot of other people have too, because you've attracted a lot of followers on YouTube. You've got a, a thriving channel, a website, everything. Um, I think one of the things you know I wanted to ask is how you would describe that because it's 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 quite interesting that you've got you've got hardcore content and you've got content about walking and hiking you've got content about as you mentioned earlier red squirrels quite a lot of mentions I noticed um and <laughs> yet also it's got other purposes and you've mentioned some of your sort of missions just along the way earlier in in our chat um, how would you describe that channel to, to someone who hadn't been there before? Well, ultimately, the channel comes under the brand of Spend More Time in the Wild, which is sort of the the project that I, I host and I run. Um, and Wild is purely about inspiring and empowering people to get outside for the benefit of mental and physical health, whilst building meaningful connections with the natural world and with each other. So it's quite a long mission statement, but it really summarizes everything on there. So whether it's sitting outside playing an instrument, whether it's doing something mindful, whether it's pushing yourself to climb the highest mountain in a country in Morocco or Tanzania or in Scotland or wherever it is, 
Um, you know, it's about understanding that the, the core message is about connection with ourselves, with other people and with the natural world. And the reason why that's so important to me is because, you know, I'm somebody who struggles with mental health and chronic pain. And I go out on these trips and I share my story um, with this you know, foundation uh, message uh, in order to help other people understand that whatever fears and barriers and obstacles they're dealing with, there's so much more life on the other side of that. And I think we can all hit plateaus and we can all have our face plants and we can all sort of, quote unquote, give up on ourselves, even if it isn't a direct, like, I'm done with this. It's just sort of, you know, mentally checking out from our dreams and passions. And I'm sort of here to rally the troops and and remind folks that, like, life is happening now. It's not tomorrow. It's today. And we have a choice every single day to, as I say, get up, get out and spend more time in the wild. But the key part in that is we have to believe that we can. And that's ultimately what my work is about. It's about sort of injecting a shot of hope and belief back into folks to watch my videos so that they can step up and, you know, step back into chasing their dreams, no matter how big or small they are. Um, because, you know, I personally believe that adventure is an attitude and we don't have to be doing the gnarliest, most dangerous challenge to have an adventure. Um, it really can just be a case of, you know, walking the dog around the same field every day. But this time we're not on our phone. We're actually in the moment conscious and realizing like, oh, look, the elderflower's out. And there's, oh, I always wanted to make some elderflower cordial. Like for me, that is an adventure because you're stepping out, you're learning a new skill and you're connecting with nature and ultimately our roots in our home. Um, through sort of intentional practice. So that's that's what Wild is all about. Talking of, of, of gnarly old experiences, I, I didn't pick an active volcano as my background for, for no reason at all. Um, <laughs> but where are the um, the most challenging places you've had to film? I mean, you've, you've been in some pretty crazy places. And I have to say, some of your videos have made me feel really very queasy as someone speaking with a pretty lousy head for heights. Um, some of that Via Ferrata stuff you did in the Alps just just terrifies the heck out of me. But where have you found it most difficult to film? To be honest, the Via Ferrata is fantastic fun and I could do that every single day. The By far the most challenging trip, or at least recently I've had, was in the Outer Hebrides. Um, so the Outer Hebrides, you've got a big chain of eight, um, 10 islands. And there's a trail called the Hebridean Way, which connects all of these islands. And you've got to catch ferries and some of them you walk across causeways. There's a hundred and something or other miles. Uh, and I did it in 12 days. And my one word for this trip was, OK, two words, absolutely brutal. <laughs> um, just it's a, it's, a, it's a stunning place. If you can go there, go there. But I don't really recommend like doing the hike because it's just it's bog. Like I got foot rot and athlete's foot. Um, I was absolutely covered in ticks. Like I must have had multiple hundreds. It didn't stop raining. And then when it was sunny, it was somehow still raining at the same time. And I just got a little bit miserable up there. <laughs> um, there's, you know, I think people often think that the sort of physical exertion is the bit that gets to me, but it's not. Like quite often it's the elements and it's the conditions under feet uh, or underfoot rather, because, you know, it can be hard work, especially when you're, you know, actually practically working for the sort of 14, 16 hour window to also take that time to look after your kit and look after your body. So sort of that that personal maintenance can be quite difficult. And, uh, you know, there's a reason why the military operate out in, in the northernmost points of Scotland, uh, because it's tough out there, <laughs> uh, particularly where there's no designated footpaths. So, How would you compare yeah. the, the Hebridean Way, say, to the West Highland Way? Uh, I wouldn't. <laughs> I think the only thing comparable is they're both in Scotland. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, West Highland Way is a fantastic trail. Uh, it's way marked. There's actual paths. Um, for me, there's no such thing as bog on the West Highland Way. And I think there's a, you can deal with a certain amount of poor weather because if you know there's always going to be amenities or a campsite or somewhere you can just drop out of it. Um, there was very little relief or escape from these conditions on the Hebridean Way and... Uh, whilst the first half is signposted, the second half is sort of run out of funding. So you really do need to be able to navigate. But a lot of the time there aren't any footpaths. So you are literally just chin deep in, I don't want to know what, like decaying matter. <laughs> um, you put yeah. it very nicely. Yes. But, you know, I find that the only thing I can say is like, I'm not anti the Outer Hebrides by any stretch of the imagination. In fact, I think if you can go there, like, take the opportunity the west island way is, is is amazing it's a really nice sort of introduction to the highlands 
the Outer Hebrides are an absolute gem. Like the white sand beaches, the wildlife, the big open skies, like, and that's that's what I sort of summarized in this video is whilst it's been really hard, the reason why it's been hard is because it's actually wild. <laughs> it's untamed. And that is exactly how it should be in a place like that. And like, I'm the traveler, the person who's passing through, and it's up to me to sort of take it or leave it and choose my perspective and the lens through which I'm looking at all of this. And I think, you know, I could look down at the bog and get grumpy, and I certainly did, um, or I can look up and whilst the rain is coming and going, that means you've got an ever-changing light show. You know, the, the, the beauty of that place is surreal and yeah, I'd like to go back, but um, potentially with a bicycle rather than walking boots. <laughs> <laughs> They're not great in bogs either, but that's uh, that's another. No, one. true. I'll stick to the roads. <laughs> <laughs> so, what are, on your on your bucket list uh, for the immediate future of, of of places that you 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 want to go? You talked about further and further afield. What's uh, what's going to float your boat in the next uh, next uh, period? Well, this year I've got very, um, I'm, well, I'm done with my UK shoots as of um, the end of May 2023. Uh, so the rest of them are international. I won't share too much about that, but there's going to be a lot of big mountains. And for the first time, I'll be crossing into the Arctic Circle, which is quite exciting. Um, but to be honest, I feel I slightly constrain myself to within Europe at the moment because I have uh, some people who have watched my channel might see my wee little dog pop up every so often. He's Bobby. He's a little Yorkshire Terrier. Uh, he's 14 right now and he's an older lad. And for me, it's so important to be, you know, a day's flight away in order to get back if anything starts to happen with him. So I'm basically looking at Europe, but I won't lie, Colin, like the world is big and it really excites me. So I can't wait for the days where, you know, I really start to step into these true wildernesses and I'm not afraid to do that. Um, but I think what I'm doing right now with my sort of travel restrictions on myself is I'm actually starting to get back into my scuba diving and, uh, you know, explore the underwater world. And that for me feels like a whole new wilderness. And it's really expanded my horizons sort of quote unquote locally within, you know, the UK and Europe. Um, and for somebody who's very afraid of water, it also is that challenge. So it takes all of the boxes for me. Uh, and of course, I'm exploring ways in which I can start to film this and tell my story. Um, so I'm very looking forward to bringing that to to Wild as well, because um, I do love it. Well, look, Abby, just want to thank you so much for spending the time with us to tell us a bit about your channel. Um, to everyone on our channel viewing this, please do check it out. The links are all below. And I know that you'll find um, Abby's work incredibly rewarding, incredibly interesting. And uh, go explore it. Thank you, Colin. It's been an absolute pleasure.